like to invite you to pull out your Bible, the Bible in the chair in front of you, or your worship bulletin, which has our scripture reading for today. And I would like to actually invite you all to read along with me, so that might be interesting. It may not all sound exactly the same, but the ones from the Pew Bible I'll be reading is from the New Revised Standard Version. So I invite you to join me in saying, keep watch over yourselves and over all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you over the years. He shepherds the church of God, that he obtained with the blood of his own son. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, as we again come this morning, Seeking your presence, seeking your guidance, your will. I ask that the words that I speak might be consistent with your will for us. And sincerely, if anyone needs to hear a different message, that you might speak directly to their heart, mind, and soul. That they may be aware of the love, care, peace, and comfort you have in this moment. For it's in your son's name we pray. There is a story, I believe it comes from one of Tony Campello's books, and it's the story about a community on the East Coast, and there was a tragic boat accident, and what they came to find out was, was that in the midst of the fog and the storm, which took the lives of some of the people on that boat, that the reason was because there was not a lighthouse nearby enough for them to see. So they decided it was important to build a lighthouse. And so they built this lighthouse and it worked well and it started being used. And sometimes there were special situations where people needed aid and they were able to go to that lighthouse and receive it. And on foggy days they were able to look at it and find guidance from it. But as things will happen over the course of time, it started to kind of maybe get run down a little bit. And people looked around and thought it needed renovation. So they held their capital campaign, if you will, raised money and went in and refurbished the inside of it. So it was really nice. In fact, it was so nice that they started having some of their community meetings there. And then in the midst one day of one of those meetings, there were a group of people who had needed some care and need and came to the lighthouse off of the water. And they were stinky and smelly and very disruptive for the meeting. And we know there's nothing we hate more than people that are disruptive to our meetings, right? And the people realized they really didn't like that. And so they started trying to put a committee together to find a way to resolve the issue. And what they decided was, was this lighthouse was so nice and so valued by the community that they would build another lighthouse a mile or so up the road or up the water to serve as the real lighthouse, and then that would be a community gathering. Well, you might guess where the story goes from there, because the same pattern continued in a series of lighthouses that were built and developed alongside the water. I thought of this story when I was thinking about the sermon today with church and need. I think sometimes, in essence, what we have done in the church is a similar thing. We build beautiful buildings that are very elegant and nice, and then we start putting rules on the building which limit the original purpose for which that building was constructed. What does it mean to be the church? What is God calling for you and I to be in the representation of the church? Now, typically, we look at just through history, and the church has gone through some major changes. Sometimes people are surprised to find that Sunday school is really a fairly recent phenomenon in the modern church. Certainly education was going on, but not Sunday school in the format that we know it. And of course, the worship styles have varied. And 
in regard to music, it said that there's been more music fads and changes in the Christian church industry in the past 50 years than there were for centuries beforehand. What does it mean to do church and to do church right? It's a challenge that we strive to wrap our minds around as we go through fads. And one of those fads that has taken place in more recent years is the emergent church. And I had the opportunity a couple of years ago to hear Phyllis Tickle speak at a conference in St. Louis. And Phyllis is a lay minister in the Episcopal Church. She is most known, though, for her um, work in the academic world as well as her work as an author. And she's been published in virtually every prominent magazine in the United States. So she is well known in certain circles. And it was a real gift and a challenge for me to listen to her when she spoke because she is very much a thinker, but at the same time, she liked her church traditional. She liked her church her way. But because of the settings that she was in, it allowed her to be more around some of the people involved in the emergent movement. And it challenged her to think and to rethink church. And part of the question that comes out of that dialogue is, does God need church? Does God need the church? And while those of us that find employment from it want to say yes very quickly, <laughs> the reality is God doesn't need church at all. But it's one of the ways that God uses us, people, to represent God in the world and the community and to reach out to the community as making God more tangible to their daily lives. That's a part of what the church is supposed to be. But sometimes we start looking at the rules. And one of the things that the emergent church is more based upon is things like community. For example, like when Brian prayed over the bears this morning, that experience of going and doing the building bear project, intentionally doing it, thinking about the battered women and the response that they were giving, that was a church experience. Would you agree? Is that church as much as church is this morning? As I recall, there weren't any hymns sung that afternoon. There were some prayers that took place with a little bit of nudging. But it was still very much church. It was still very much worship. It was still very much reaching out to make God tangible, not only in the lives of of those battered women or their children, but for our youth and the adults that were there as well. That was truly church. And when we think about church, one of our challenges is to think about what it means to be the church that has certain needs. For example, the church needs money, do you not? And you know, I talked last week a little bit, there is a difference between needs and wants. But needs are pretty high financially when it comes to making a church run. If we want to even have our, our electric on, we want to have lights, we want to have an organ, we want to have some of these things that take other power sources. But in the midst of that, I'm also mindful of going to my dad's church that he grew up in. An old country church, which when he was in it didn't have electricity. Had windows as their air ventilation system. Very different worship experience. And so coming out of that culture, it is so different than when we look at a church that has a nice gym, very well padded chairs. How many of y'all sat on pews without pads? How many of y'all don't know what pews are? And that's starting to happen more and more, isn't it? Not to mention one that has a cushion on it. What does it mean to be a, a church that has a wonderful sign out front? Like we do. That we've had so many compliments on for people in the church, outside the church. We've already had someone call and, and say,
say, hey, who did that sign for you? We want one too. What does it mean to be the church in the backdrop of what my father's worship experience was like and what my worship experience is like? And are those authentically church? When Cole comes up and plays at the front, is that authentically church? When Jane comes and leads us and plays such beautiful songs, the piano and the organ, is that church? Or what makes it church or makes it not church? Now, as wonderful as Jean is on the piano and organ, we're going to have that chance to march night to hear more with her and her sister. If she's just out playing somewhere, is it worship? If she comes in here half-hearted, okay, looks at the notes on the page and just plays, is that worship? If Cole gets up and plays the guitar because his mom told him to, is that worship? <laughs> it's not, is it? To really be worship, and this is what I think the difference is, whether it's an emergent church, whether it's the church that you and I are experiencing this morning, whether it's still an old country church that still meets, it's like my dad's to hear him tell those stories. It is nothing if it is not anointed with the presence of Christ. If it is not anointed in the blood of Christ. If the focus of everything is not centered around Christ. I want to invite you to look back at the scripture again and look at this letter. Well, let's just read the whole verse. Keep watch over yourselves, that be us ones, right? Yourselves, and over all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. In this church tradition, we believe in the priesthood of all believers, true? And if we're all priests, if we're all called to ministry, if we're all called to be a tangible representation of God, you are a part of this overseer group. And then this next line, which sometimes I don't want people to have the job, I'd rather pick and choose, but apparently God thinks God does more than I do. To shepherd the church of God. Every one of you has a role. Every one of you has a responsibility, not just an opportunity. Yes, an opportunity, but a responsibility to shepherd the church. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your gender, your economic background. One of the things that Phyllis Tickle said when she was speaking was she shared what she considered to be rather liberal or brave or very strong words about the tradition that she came from and looking at the issues of emergence. Because emergence have received some unfair blame for how they go about worship. But you know what Phyllis Tickle said to the group? She's 80 now. This is two years ago. She goes, you know what? I'm 78, I can pretty much say what I want. <laughs> One of the challenges in church is that we are responsible for shepherding. And then sometimes that means not caring what the other people say or think, but to do it because in your heart and your soul, it is anointed with the blood of Jesus. Now, I don't want anybody to get worried. I'm not going to get too charismatic. But I do think it's very important to think about what it means to be the church. And if we are not anointed in the blood of Jesus, what are we anointed with? What are our motivations? Where do our actions come from? Certainly one of the things that we see in the recent years is the way the church has become so commercial. Now I actually think there's a place for that. But it's not me. And I think there's some that are authentic, good, and true. But I think there's some that are not. If they're not anointed, they're pointless. If they don't seek to be anointed by God, they're pointless. What about the beggar church? How many of y'all have ever been asked from a church to give money? Someone who has made that comment 
I can go to church here. All I ever seem to do is ask for money. Maybe you've even had that experience yourself. But one of the things that is true for, for most churches, and definitely for our church, when we take special offerings for special things like today's Week of Compassion, how much of that money does the local church keep? Zero. We don't keep any of it. And we're also a tithing church, which means we designate 10% of our monies to go to mission and outreach. So when we do those special offerings, that's over and above. We're way above 10% as a congregation in giving. To me, that's an example of us being intentional about how we do our money and seeking for it truly to be anointed with the blood of God that is for God's kingdom, not for our motivations, not for our reasons. And the reality is, the beggar church loses its focus. And we can do this too. For it becomes more about the business than it does about the spirit. And I think Bob Sanderson still recovered from a baseball game, so I can't pick on him too much today. But he likes to remind us of the business of church. And that's a good shepherding message, isn't it? It is. But we can't be all about that. We want even... When we ask for money, for that money to be very focused on where it's going and to know where our money's going. That's a part of what it means to be the church, to shepherd, to, to look out for one another, to be responsible with our giving. But on the other hand, we can go too far to the other extreme. And, and I'm a little challenged by some of these things. I'm going to speak about the money first and then another piece second. When I was in Arkansas, there was a church that wasn't very far from us. Originally, the minister had been Baptist. There was some conflict in the church. He was asked to leave. He went out, started a new non-denominational church. And as a part of joining that church, when you do, one of the things you're asked to immediately do is to provide a W-2 form to the church. Now, we're going to start doing that, so everybody bring it next to me. <laughs> Apparently, y'all think I'm kidding. <laughs> we don't do that, but you know what? Man, that church grew a lot. It's a huge church. It's one of the biggest in that area. It's nice to help your members be faithful steward givers. But it is that, and I'm not saying it's not, because it's not my place to question. I don't know. I don't know enough about it. But if we were to do that, I would question what our motivations were. Is that really acting as the church anointed in the blood of Christ? Because i tell you what, man, I don't want to know some of that stuff. I mean, some of y'all might have a lot of money and you're not giving it to me. But another interesting thing to think about some of those same churches that have had so much growth in, say, the past 10 to 20 years, is they're also very demanding in other ways. If you join the church, give you a covenant, a piece of paper, these are the rules, this is what we abide by, we're glad to have your membership, just sign the bottom line. And some of those demanding churches are the same ones that are growing. I've done a lot of studying, I've done a lot of reading, it still doesn't make a lot of sense to me, except for if people like their faith to be presented in a box before them, in a box to give to God. For me, for me, that wouldn't be an authentic way for me to worship. I think God gives us a variety of churches and spiritual opportunities, but that doesn't mean every one of them is for me. And I think that's part of the gift of the diversity of God. But when we think about what it means to be the church that God calls us to be, and we think about what it means to be a New Testament church, a part of the restoration movement in the United States, I look to the example that Christ had. Did Christ have a nice fancy building? Did Christ have a gym? Did Christ have a sign that they took everywhere they went? It was a group of people, a relatively small group of people traveling together, followed by mass crowds, Spending time together, hanging out, praying together, eating together. You think that was church? Or do you think Jesus got wrong? Not to make you feel guilty. Not to set you up. 
And it's not that I'm saying that we're not no longer what the church is, but what I'm saying is we need to be intentional with who we are as the church. We are needy. We do have things when we come in here that we need to experience in the worship service. But sometimes what we come in with is an agenda that's more about want than it is about need. And the reality is, God doesn't need us, but God chooses us to be his vessels, to be his representation. And it's up for you and I to take the time to stop and really lay anointing on everything. I had a, and this is literally anointing, I had a, uh, an opportunity, a friend of mine, I don't know why I just thought of this, um, Marlon, Texas, he asked me to be in his wedding. There were three white people there. Two of them were out there, and I was up front. And James Chaplin was his name, and, and James had asked if I would stand up with him. I got to know him. Uh, we played softball against each other for a couple years in Texas and got to know each other. And before the wedding, we went back to this back room um, in front of the sanctuary, and they got out the olive oil. The extra virgin. Oh, <laughs> And so they were getting ready to pray, and before they prayed, they, they poured that oil on their hands. And James said, do you want some? And I said, you know, I'm glad to do what you know, this is your thing, I'm trying to just so I did. But they went to an extreme that I did not expect, that I had not seen before. They not only anointed their faces, they anointed their whole heads. Now we had different hairstyles, <laughs> that wasn't going to work as well with my hair. But they, they kind of really bathed themselves in the oil, seeking God's presence, seeking God's touch, that that way was authentically a part of spiritual unity with God and the Lord. Now, I would like to go anoint the sign. I would like to anoint the gym. I would like to anoint every chair in here. And I would like to anoint every head in here. But sometimes... It's not about the literal. It's about the physical. And everything we do, if we're going to be the church that God wants us to be, and if we're going to be the church that people need us to be, we're going to anoint everything we do. If we can't imagine God's cloak around everything we do, every decision we make, then we need to question whether we're doing it the right way. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard. But as we go into this week, and the weeks, and the months, and the years to come, may this church always be one that truly seeks out to be useful for God's purposes. That we truly may be His church, whatever form that takes, whatever experience 